Hello, and welcome to Aging on the Sun Coast. I'm Regina Novak, Director of Outreach for the Area Agency on Aging for Pasco and Pinellas County. We are excited to bring you today's episode on how to prepare for hurricane season, because we know this is all on your minds. Hurricane season officially runs from June 1st through November 30th. Sadly, we've seen the devastation in our state and elsewhere, and some of the more recent storms like Charlie, Floyd, Irma, Ian, and last year's Adalia hit way too close to home for many of us. The devastation is unimaginable, and I'm sure most of us watched with heavy hearts as we saw what so many of our neighbors have been through. I myself have several friends that had significant flooding the past two years, and that was very scary for them and very difficult for months following. Our goal today is to arm you with information that you can take action on now so you can make the best decision for you and your family, regardless of what the storm season has in store for us. I am delighted and honored to introduce you to today's guest, Division Chief Javon Graham. Chief Javon Graham oversees the Division of Emergency Management as the Emergency Manager and Coordinator for the City of Clearwater. He has over 25 years of experience in fire, EMS, and emergency management. He joined Clearwater Fire and Rescue in July of 1999 as a firefighter EMT and was an active member of not only the tech team, but the Marine Response Team and the Dive Team. He has held his current position as the Division Chief of Emergency Management since 2017. Chief Graham is a nationally accredited fire instructor and fire officer and has a variety of certifications relating to FEMA, emergency management, and the fire service. He holds the Chief Fire Officer designation from the Center for Public Safety Excellence, is credentialed with the Emergency Services Leadership Institute, and is recognized as an emergency manager with the International Association of Emergency Management. Along with being an adjunct instructor for St. Petersburg College, Division Chief Graham has a Master of Public Administration degree in Emergency Services from Columbia Southern University. And aside from that very impressive resume, I can personally tell you he's one of the best people I know, and I've had the great honor of working alongside him before. So I am thrilled to introduce you all now to my good friend, Chief Javon Graham. Thank you. Thank you Welcome. for having me. Welcome. Thank you. It's been a while. I miss working with you. Yes, yes. And this is the first official show that I'm hosting, so I was delighted that I got to have you be the first guest. Well, I'm honored. Thank you. It was good to see you again. Good to see you. So I want to start with getting a little bit more information on your overall experience with storm season. You know, I mentioned in the intro, you've been in the fire service for over 25 years, but in your current position, it's been seven years. And as a lot of you probably remember, 2017 was when Irma hit. That's the year you were promoted. Yep. So give us a little overview of what you've experienced. And really, with kind of the past couple years, the storms we've had, what have we learned in those seven years you've been in this position? So that's a good point. Um, so yes, I was promoted in 2017. And right before, right after I got promoted, Irma hit. So according to our city, I'm the cause for all this because we've been busy every single year. <laughs> but it's been incredible. So yes, what we've learned is that every single year, the threats, the hurricane uh, experiences, the hurricane warnings, everything is becoming more amped up, more ramped up. Um, every season is bringing more and more storms, which are bringing more and more hazards. Uh, the last few years, we've actually seen more flooding than we've seen in the, in the past. Yes. And this is something we're worried about as well. So we're really trying to prep people on, hey, take the warnings, make plans, look at what's happening. Uh, we've had a lot of close calls in our area, you know, that the storms have gone either south of us, north of us, or just breeze by us, and we need to take the warnings. We're due to get hit with something. And as the more activities out there, the more we need to actually take the threat serious. Well, you bring up a great point because I think that piece of, you know, missing the major impact of it, right? And to your point, we have seen more in our area these mm -hmm. past couple of years. But thinking, I remember being a little girl in 1992 when Andrew hit. Yep and watching in horror. So to your point, we've been, may I say, incredibly blessed, but we should not take that for granted. Right, right. And an example for evacuations, and I know we'll talk about some of that later, but uh, during Ian, we had like 35,000 people evacuate. Well, because it passed us or didn't hit us during Adalia, only 5,000 evacuated. So sometimes that complacency kicks in and people say, oh, we're not gonna get hit, but, we, we, we're due, and if we do, we want to be prepared. We want to take the warning seriously. We want to listen to the experts, the Weather Channel, the county, the, the ones who are telling us when to evacuate, when not to, and really heed those warnings when they're coming out. Right, that preparation is really going to be key, Correct. and that is a lot of what we're going to discuss today is, you know, at the end of the day, control the controllables. Correct. None of us 
can control what the storm season is going to look like. Correct. Um, we don't even really know until we're, we're in the thick of it. But what we can do is control how we react to this and how we prepare. Exactly. We can control our own narrative and which can help our outcome and resiliency. Absolutely. Great point. So you mentioned flooding, and yes. that is a big concern for people. And I know that we have viewers in Pinellas and Pasco. And depending on where you live, there are different you know, evacuation levels. Some mm -hmm. of us are at higher risk of flooding. Let's say you do decide to evacuate to you know, a shelter or go stay with family. What are some ways that you can protect your dwelling and maybe even more specifically the belongings inside of it if you decide to leave and you leave the home, should flooding happen, what can we do to prepare for that? So if you're home, if you're living in a flood area, you do have to try and protect it, board it up, sandbags, whatever means you can to protect your belongings. Uh, another thing too is sometimes if water's gonna get in there, use waterproof containers. Okay. Uh, secure your property, so you take pictures of everything. Um, taking pre-pictures also helps if you do get uh, disaster, you get damage for your insurance. So if you get a before picture and then you say, hey, I, I did everything I could, I put in plastic totes, I put it off the ground, um, I had it up high and it still got damaged, then you're more likely to be able to get the insurance coverage and you can show what damage actually happened. Uh, one thing, one warning is mm -hmm. we tell people if you're gonna put it off up high, don't put anything on your stove. Uh, a lot of times when people put stuff high, they put it on their stoves, counters, kitchen. Well, if you lose power or power gets turned back on or your stove is bumped, then you end up having a whole nother hazard because your house catches fire. And that's a whole nother thing that on top of the hurricane damage that you're dealing with. So try and board up, use sandbags, um, cover things. Uh, but again, waterproof materials, waterproof containers is the best thing to hold to cover your personal belongings that you can't take with you and take pictures of everything. That is great uh, information because I think we kind of panic and forget, right? Mm -hmm. As if you are going to leave, you can't take everything. Correct. And there is that feeling of, what am I going to come home to? How do I protect it? So that's great information. And I'm glad you mentioned the sandbags because that's always something that people do ask about. And since we're not in storm season, of course, now, do you want to just remind everybody that as the storm season you know, progresses, as we think there could be some issues, check your local websites um, in Pasco and Pinellas because they'll have places where you can actually get sandbags, um, a there's also some great uh, resources as far as boarding up. Uh, one thing that I always love the most, I'm sure you can relate to this as well, is seeing uh, the neighborliness that mm -hmm. happens. Yeah. So like maybe your neighbor has extra things to board up. Maybe they're happy to help you. So it's thinking about those things ahead of time that you may want to have in place and maybe even getting them now, right. like water, yep. before it gets to the point where everybody's looking for 100%. it. hundred percent. You need to prepare now. The best time to prepare is preseason, not three days before a storm comes, because right. then everybody's scrambling. Everybody's trying to get their supplies. And a lot of times with sandbags, um, people think one or two is enough. It takes a lot more. It takes at least 10 to secure one door. And then if it's not done the same way or the proper way, you're still getting water intrusion in. So we're telling people, I know Pinellas County is really big on this right now. We're having expos all around the county. And actually Clearwater's doing one June 15th, which is based on mostly sandbag operations. So we're gonna give out sandbags, but we're gonna educate people, hey, get your stuff now before the storm comes so that you're prepared and not trying to rush and scramble when you can truly have a plan in place if a system comes and we have a, have a threat in our direction. That is good to know. So sandbags, uh, yes, and I think a lot of people, we just get them, but knowing how to use them Correct. properly. Right, is, because you just, just throw it there, but then if it's not stacked the right way, it's pretty much just keeping water in as opposed to keeping it out. All right, good, good. So you mentioned the insurance piece, yes. which is very important. So um, with the agency, one of the big things that we also focus on in June is World Elder Abuse Day. Mm -hmm. And we know that abuse comes in many forms yes. and financial abuse continues to be on the rise. And there are so many pieces of financial abuse, not that we will go into today, but what is oftentimes alarming um, and very sad too yes. that this yes. happens, but when there's emergencies where there's disasters. There's also an opportunity for people coming out of the woodworks to take advantage of people. Um, scams, um, crooked, dishonest home repairs, looters. We saw that um, in New Orleans many years ago with Hurricane Katrina, that looting was a big issue. What can we advise the audience to look for as far as those things? Um, if I come back to my home and there's damage, 
who do I call and how do I know if something is legit or not legit? Right. So, and it's unfortunate because you, you're already dealing with a storm and then you have the worst yes. people that do the worst things. Uh, down in Fort Myers after Ian, they actually had people boating to the different islands and trying to loot people's property and steal things after the storm. So it is a serious problem oh um, that uh, is, is out there. So one of the things you talked about your insurance, taking pictures beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the season, take pictures of your property so that you have that record and, 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 and take good photos of your insurance papers, your documentation, have all that locked away. Um, virtual is good as well as having a physical place. Now everything can be done online. So if you have a picture of everything, you can submit that to your insurance company. Okay. Look out for fraud. Unfortunately, people during these times take advantage of everyone and including especially the elderly. Mm -hmm. So don't rush to get your repairs done right away. Make sure the person who's coming to do the work is licensed and insured, mm -hmm. and a lot of times prefer that they're not from out of state. Because a lot of times if they're in state, you'll have more reliability. You'll have more, uh, if something is damaged or they can, it's more personal connection with somebody who's actually licensed in the state of Florida. So, because you'll have somebody come from outside and say, oh, I'm licensed, but they're not really valid. So, it's easier to check the licensing of somebody who's actually local and, and as opposed to somebody who's from out of state. So then you can go with your local licensing agency, your building department, and say, is this person legit? Uh, another thing, be weary of people trying to say, I need money up front. Uh, they're, if they're asking for thousands of dollars, you want to shy away from that because they're probably not legit. They're probably going to try and take your money and leave. So though you have to look out for those scams as well. Um, if you rush into a contract, sometimes people will say, they, they, they think you're in dire straits. You have to get this done right away. No, you don't have to. There's other forms of that you need to get taken care of. Let your insurance do its job before you start having somebody try and rush in because those are ones who are trying to get a quick buck and trying to leave. And then if you do notice damage or you think I might possibly be getting scammed, call your local police department. Mm -hmm. They have resources available who work specifically in those divisions and they can come out and, and make sure that you're not being taken advantage of or, or file the proper reports. Wonderful. No, that's fantastic advice. I remember one thing I always heard too was when it's different if I'm calling you, Correct. so I'm picking up the phone, you're my insurance company or you're my bank, you know, for instance, mm -hmm. I know the other person on the phone is who they're supposed to be. Correct. If someone's calling you and I need your bank account, I need your social exactly. security number. I don't actually know who that other person is exactly. on the phone. So you making the call is very different than getting a number, you're like, I don't recognize this. So that's all really wonderful advice. Um, and, and I hope that everybody keeps that in mind. Because again, you are, there's panic, there's stress. We don't always make the best decisions. Right, right. Yeah, after, after the storm, it still takes time. You still have to get your bearings and you don't want to rush. I know everybody wants to get their homes repaired, get right back to some sort of normalcy as quick as possible. However, mm -hmm. you don't want to be taken advantage of as well. Excellent, excellent. So we know there are different levels of evacuation, yes. right? And we encourage everyone to go to the Pasco and Pinellas County Emergency Management website and find out where your evacuation zone is. Um, and those may have changed. So Correct. always make sure that you're checking those every year. Can you start by explaining a little bit about what should people consider when it comes to do I stay or do I go? Well, a lot of times, and people sometimes confuse what the evacuation zones are based off of. Mm -hmm. They think it's strictly a wind event. Well, a lot of times, most of it is based off a of storm surge, okay? So you have to look at how high, how deep, how much water is actually coming in. And it doesn't always take a direct hit to, to make you have high storm surge. We can look at Adalia, who was off the coast of us and went past us, but because we were on the right side of the storm, it pushed all that extra water mm -hmm. into our areas. So if you're gonna make the decision about if I'm gonna evacuate or not, you need to think about what hazards you potentially can have. Am I already in a low-lying area? Mm -hmm. Am I, what kind of storm surge am I expected? Seven foot of storm surge is, covers up to most people's doorways. So how much water am I gonna have in my home? If I'm gonna lose power, can I survive? And I don't mean survive like my life, but do I have extra, extra equipment? Do I have a generator? Do I have food supplies? Do I have batteries? Can I sustain myself for a few days if my home is partially underwater? So you need to think about, is it safe for me to be here and also, People forget that public safety can't always come out. So if there's high waters and the areas are flooded, there's a point in time that we have to delay to come out and, and do rescues and go check on people as well. So you have to look at all those considerations and say, is it actually in my best interest to stay or should I listen and go? And if we're saying, if the, if the spe specialists and experts are saying, hey, you should evacuate, please listen to that and evacuate. They're doing that because it's a life hazard. 
Absolutely. Well, we're going to go ahead and take a short break. And when we, re- when we return, we're going to talk more about what it looks like to evacuate, what some of those options are. So stay with us and we'll be back shortly. Pinellas County is working on a sea level rise and storm surge vulnerability assessment. We need you to take a quick survey to help evaluate our community's flood risks. Lots of community locations and services in Pinellas County are at risk from flooding. Now's your chance to let us know which of those are most important to you and why. We also want to know how flooding has affected you and your community. Your input will help us ensure the places and values that mean the most to you are considered in future initiatives to reduce flooding. This assessment will enable our local government to qualify for state funding for important projects that will help prevent flooding in our county. Please help protect our communities by taking a brief survey at pinellas.gov slash flood survey. Welcome back to Aging on the Sun Coast. During the first half of the show, Chief Graham and I discussed the topic of possible flooding, how to be aware of possible fraud that might exist following a disaster, and we've started the conversation around evacuation and what to consider if we do shelter in place. We also want to look at other options of considering if we evacuate, what is the best decision for us. And when we, uh, before we went to break, I love that you mentioned about, you know, you have to know when is kind of that time frame of if I'm going to leave, I do need to leave. Because at some point, you know, all of us need to consider that, you know, yes, first responders for a lot of us are kind of our superheroes, but you have families you have to go back to as well. And there could be some very catastrophic emergencies that do have to be attended to. So something for all of us to consider that we don't, we can't stay too late because we may be putting other people at risk as well. Right. And, and so, Timing is crucial and critical if you're going to determine if you're going to go or not. Um, and that should be one of those plans you have beforehand. If you're going to go, maybe always consider that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a long way ways. It can be a short distance, just out of your evacuation zone. Uh, we're preaching now a lot of times, it's not hundreds of miles, but tens of miles. Mm-hmm. During Ian, a lot of people, and even Adaya, or, but Ian specifically, a lot of people thought Tampa Bay was getting hit directly. Well, it went south. Well, we had people that evacuated to Fort Myers and went south, and they went right to the direction. So it's not hundreds of miles, tens of miles out of the immediate threat area, out of your evacuation zone. But you hit another key point. Timing is crucial, especially in Pinellas County. Pinellas County has eight ways out of the county. Six of them are, are bridges. So if you're looking at trying to evacuate, you can get landlocked very easily because everybody's trying to evacuate. Then you're running out of fuel. Roads become impassable. So your decision needs to be made timely on if you're going to go or not when the warnings start coming out and when the projection, projection, projections are saying that you're going to get uh, start feeling impacts. Yes, and none of us wants to be stuck on the road. No, not at all. And then like, like you said earlier, uh, there's a point in time when public safety has to pull off the road. So for our fire stations, we do have two fire stations that are on the barrier island, Sand Key and, and, mm-hmm. and, and this Clearwater Beach. We have to evacuate those off the island. So if something happens down there and the winds are too high or, or it's flooded too much, we can't get to you immediately until we can either get a boat ready or whatever else, which is staged, but it puts that extra level of, of risk. And so that's one thing to remember, too. There's a point in time when public safety can't go out even after the storm because there's wires down, there's debris, there's trees. So making that decision to move or evacuate to a shelter that fits your needs is, is needs to be done before before the actual event comes. Absolutely. And, and that's kind of the next thing we want to get into is, you know, there are different options. Yes. to, you know, you could go to family. Um, some people, again, go those hundreds of miles. Some goes those, those tens of miles. But one thing that a lot of people have a question on is where are the shelters? And at this time, if you go on either Pinellas or Pasco's website, they're not going to have those available because we don't have a storm happening right, right. now. Right. But those will tell you where some of those shelters are going to be. And we have some that are going to be special needs shelters. Yep. There's going to be some that are also going to be pet friendly, which I know is a big one for our audience. Yep. A lot of furry friends yes, yes, that people are furry kids. <laughs> yes, right. So, and do not leave your animals behind. Um, one point on that um, that I did want to mention: Pasco County, um, they have some 
excellent information on their website around what to bring for your pet. So sort of a, a pet preparedness uh, kit, as well as information on livestock, what to do with livestock during a storm, right? Some of those things that, again, we might not think about, so do check their emergency management. But when we talk about those special needs shelters, what does that look like? If that's something that, let's say I'm a caregiver, right, and my care partner is going to need um, you know, more care than maybe even sometimes I can deliver on my own. How do we go about registering for that? Is it something we do have to register for? What does some of those considerations look like? Most definitely, and you, you're, you're exactly spot on. You have the three types of shelters, general population, pet friendly, and special needs. Mm -hmm. Special needs, you should re pre-register because those are the ones that are for those who have different medical emergencies, mm -hmm. uh, oxygen dependent, um, they need uh, electric electric capability all the time. Special needs shelters will always have a generator. And a lot of people don't realize, but most of the shelters are pretty much just a lifeboat. They're not guaranteed to have a generator. And so if you're going there, it's just your basic creature comforts. But if you have special needs or require special medical attention, mm -hmm. you need to pre-register. You can go to Pinellas County or Pasco, but Pinellas County's uh, emergency management site and pre-register for special needs. Mm -hmm. And it'll, it'll walk you through everything you need to bring. Okay. Uh, so if you have special medications, you need to bring that. They'll give you your basics, mm -hmm. but if you have extra oxygen you need to bring, or, or you have special medications that are specific to your case, you can bring that. But they lay out exactly what shelters those are going to be, and then before the storm comes, you're called to make sure, do you still need that shelter or do you need to be picked up? Because those will actually definitely will pick up and take you to those shelters to, that fit your needs. Excellent. But the key is... Pre-register. Do it now. And yes. do it now. We don't, nothing needs to be last minute. Nope. And we can, and a lot of times, like you said, with the shelters, the, the counties will post all the shelters, mm -hmm. okay? There's a lot of counties, there's a lot of shelters that are based out of schools, they're based out of rec centers. Um, and so depending on the storm, depending on the expected impact, will determine exactly what shelters are going to open. So you won't know that until the storm is getting closer and then you'll have to gauge, okay, this is the shelter I'm going to, or this is the one they're going to take me to. So we talked about transportation. Um, pets. So service animals that perform a service for someone with a disability, they do not have to be pre-registered. No. Is my understanding. Correct. Okay. Correct. But even at the pet friendly shelters, you do need to let them know Correct. that this is okay. And also, and people forget, just like you need to bring your own uh, special medicines, foods, you need to do the same thing for your pets. So Absolutely. if they bring extra water, put them in crates, um, and, and think about your, your space that you're gonna have for the special, or shelters don't have a lot of space per person. Right. And so, and we have to understand as well that unless they're um, your special service animals, they're not actually gonna be with you either. So your pets are gonna be put in a crate, put in a separate area to take care of the other people who are gonna be in the, in the shelter. So you need to know that as well, that your pet may not necessarily be with you, you'll have access to them, but they have to look out for the space to put the max amount of people in the, in the shelters. Absolutely, and I know there's some requirements too. Um, I was on Pasco County's website and they mentioned you know, vaccines and microchipping. Yes. So again, something that consider now yes. um, to make sure that again, your pet is able to come to that shelter. Um, so regardless of whether we shelter or evacuate, let's say we do sustain danger, um, damage, right? Um, you mentioned something I wanna go back to before that was really important. What do we do after the storm? Because just because, again, the storm has passed mm -hmm. does not mean that, all right, yep, let's pack up all my stuff, see ya, you know, bye to the family, bye to the shelter, and we just rush home. Right. That might not be the case. No. So what... Where do we go for that information? What kind of things should we be aware of before we return home? Good question. If you're at a shelter, the shelters are currently in contact with all the counties and emergency operations centers, and they will advise when it's safe to let people go back out. Mm -hmm. um, some of your items that you need to bring with you, batteries, radios, portable radios, uh, something that can actually notify you so you can listen to the weather, you can listen to news, only reputable news outlets, not some of these you know, podcasts or everything else. You need to make sure you actually have the true information that's coming out. Uh, Pinellas County and Pasco also has Alert Pinellas. I think it's Alert pa Pasco for Pasco. And that sends notifications to your, your phones, to your emails and stuff, and it gives you up-to-date information. Um, you don't wanna rush back out. After the storm, especially if it's dark, there's power lines down, there's flooding. Flooding brings where it takes the manhole covers off, so you have different areas where you can potentially drown. Mm -hmm. um, there's animals. A lot of times people forget that just as well as your house got flooded, animals' homes and habitats are flooded as well. 
down in Fort Myers, they were dealing with a snake problem because all the areas that got flooded was pushing all the snakes into the air, into the, in people's homes. So you have to wait till it's safe. Public safety, the counties will tell you, it's okay to go back home. It's okay to check your, your houses out because we have to make sure we clear everything first or get all the major uh, extra damage or extra hazards that can, are life-threatening out the way first. Absolutely. Um, definitely do not want to come home to snakes <laughs> in the house. No, no. Oh, my goodness. Um, yes. Yeah, so you want to make sure. Um, so everybody watching this, you want to stay alert. Yep. Know, was there flooding? Where is the flooding? Um, I think you also brought something up that was very important because I remember after Irma, again, thank God we did not, the house was not damaged. But we did have no internet, we had no power for, right. and that did impact a lot of people. And um, obviously um, the local community did a wonderful job and worked tirelessly to get us back on our feet as quickly as possible. Right. But there was a period of time where this is just kind of what it is. So when we talked about that preparation, um, the food, right, the medication, like yes. Two weeks? I mean, should people figure two weeks? Because, again, if you're out without power or you couldn't get to the store, that's not the time that you want to be panicked that, right. oh, well, I can't get to my local pharmacy because, you know, this, that, or the other thing. Those preparations really need to be in place for all of us just because we, we don't know the true impact until right. after right. it's happened. Right. And, again, your, your, your local counties will let you know some of the information, but especially with your medications, there is a law that allows you to get a month's supply of medication okay. if, if it's a declared emergency just for that reason because you don't know how long you might be impacted or what impacts you're actually going to face. Um, and one thing, we talked about preparation, and I didn't mention this earlier, but when you prepare your home, make sure if you have things outside your home, you bring it in because those yes. become projectiles. They can If your home supplies, grills, or whatever else are outside, it can damage somebody else's property just as well. So yes. be cognizant of everybody and make sure you secure everything. Well, and that, that's such an important point. Um, you know, we see that with a lot of our parks and rec departments. Yep. That's one of the things they prep, you yep. know, to make sure, like at the pools, they'll make sure that everything is secure. But I think as we kind of wrap up, one thing that is a good reminder for all of us is that, as you said, you take the pictures, right? You report to the insurance. Things can be replaced. Exactly. People cannot. If it's something where we are told to evacuate, you know, it's, we take ourselves, we take our pets, we take our loved ones. I remember telling my children, if there's anything that insurance can't re replace, and that's not your clothes, that's not your TV or your yep. Game Boy, if it's something that is irreplaceable, that's what we're putting in the car right. to leave with. Because at the end of the day, it's the loss of life. Exactly. That is really the key point that we want to make sure that people are safe. Yes, losing things, damage to the house, it's, it can be devastating and stressful. But at the end of the day, if we and our loved ones are safe, that's really what all of this is about. 100%. Taking care of your life and being alive and around for your family. Yes. And again, to your point before, making sure that we're getting out in time because our first responders are going to be tested to the max and they're going to have sometimes some really true emergencies they have to get to. And we don't want to put their lives in jeopardy if we could have we could have left Correct. before. So, Chief Graham, I am so excited <laughs> that you came on today. You gave us some wonderful information. Um, a lot of the uh, numbers and the websites we talked about, they're going to be on your screen, so please refer to those. Again, Pasco County Emergency Management, Pinellas County Emergency Management. Um, the Facebook page, I know, can also be a great um, place for you to look. So I do want to thank you for your knowledge and your time today. Also uh, want to thank Tambry Lane out of Pasco County. She wasn't able to be with us today. Uh, they have some other events that they're doing at the time of the taping, but she was a wealth of information in preparing for today's episode, and the, their staff has done a fabulous job. There's some great videos on Pasco uh, Emergency Management's website that can give you some information. So we hope that you learned a great deal from this month's broadcast and that you'll join us for future episodes. Hopefully we'll get Chief Graham back on here for another topic. Anytime. But may, may we all be safe, our first responders as well as all of us. And remember, now is the time to prepare, figure out what is best for your situation, and we hope that all of us get through another hurricane season safe and sound. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next month.